As cannabis activists, we have discovered that the cannabis conversation cuts through every line we have drawn in drug policy and is no longer simply about to legalize or not to legalize. Cannabis prohibition and the broader war on drugs are policies that are a product of colonialism. This has led to a host of unintended negative consequences that are hampering development of evidence-based drugs policy fit for task in the 21st century. At CND 65, our organization hosted a side event making the case for evidence-based drug policy. And this year's event will expand the conversation to explore how the road towards evidence-based policy can also serve to resolve many of the hurdles faced by developing countries in the attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals. What is at issue here is herbal cannabis. The current conversation, particularly in Africa, is narrowly confined to pharmaceutical cannabis without any consideration of the consequences for poorer countries with a legacy of the use, cultivation and trade in cannabis. These are the countries that have been left behind as their former colonial masters relish the profits from cannabis that is grown indoors using excessive amounts of energy. In South Africa, we have power blackouts for upwards of six hours a day, every day. Yet the only fully legal cannabis is grown under lights. South Africa is trying to grow for a market that is able to afford a pharmaceutical grade product that once grew in the wild in areas where, botanically, it was intended by nature to grow. How can we even start to work towards SDG number one? no poverty, when the traditional livelihoods of our cannabis farmers have been captured for foreign profit. From the environmental impact of and drugs as a weapon of war, to member states' compliance with the treaties, this side event will explore how the changing landscape of cannabis law reform can guide the conversations around the most pressing issues of our time. Today we have four very diverse speakers here at CND. It is my pleasure to introduce Paul Michael Keichel, who is a remote working lawyer for Cullinan and Associates in Cape Town. And it's very nice to see some of the associates from Cullinan's on the webinar with us today. Paul Michael is a wannabe farmer in rural KwaZulu-Natal province in South Africa. He has been engaged in numerous streams of strategic litigation to change South Africa's backwards drug laws and has made notable representations to governments on the same topic. Paul Michael. Thank you indeed, Myrtle. Good morning to everybody who's joining us and everybody who got up so early to come and join us in person. Thank you. Today, I limit myself to addressing you on sustainable development goal number 10, which is reduced inequalities. I understand this to extend to reducing unequal laws and agreements and the unequal and arbitrary application onto civil society of those laws and agreements. What is the world's most widely used psychoactive drug? It's caffeine. What lights up parts of your brain on an fMRI, as does cocaine, and is the true gateway to addiction and one's body rotting away? You'd be correct if you knew your guest that it's sugar. Let us please maintain some perspective here then. In the rotunda just down the hallway here in the United Nations, displays are promoting fashionably ethical caffeine offerings of various member states. Caffeine and sugar products mass produced in large factories around our world are available from vending machines in these hallowed hallways in exchange for only a few euro cents. Why do we consume these substances without a second thought, often as part of our respectable morning rituals? Yet we're also dedicating so much time this week to the fine print of whether to loosen our global controls over analogous indulgences and vices. There were at least three outstanding statements from the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, His Excellency Volker Turk, as he contributed to the opening of the plenary session on Monday. These have been reinforced by many member states and UN representatives here since. These were the following, and I paraphrase. Number one, drug policy must be grounded in human rights. Number two, 
bad drug policy, including criminalization, especially when enforced militaristically, can clearly do more harm to society and individuals than the often vague drug harms that individual member states and this umbrella body would say that they are trying to prevent. Number three, policies, uh, prohibition policies and the war on drugs have proved to be failures and should be abandoned in favor of transformative human-centered policies. In short, the enforcement of drug prohibition through the criminal justice systems of our world equates to or at least results in the violation of fundamental human rights. I'm not sure that such explicit statements by a chief of human rights for the United, for the United Nations can or should be sidestepped or snowed, under, or snowed under any longer. The arrest and incarceration, arrests and incarcerations are experienced by human beings as violence. We would all like to think that we are anti-violence, yes? We would also all like to think that we want for all of humanity those ideals that underscore our sustainable development goals, yes? And that includes that we are all treated equally and that like cases attract like interventions. So I pose some questions here today. What are the real life civil society consequences of member states not dropping the war on drugs? And I pause to reflect on that it's actually a war on drug users, with the same vigor with which they picked it up. And what relation can that have to that? The only way that war on drugs from the United Nations. I'm only able to speak from my second perspective today. But we know that most efforts towards local law reform have been met with the blanket statement from our government that we have international obligations. So we find ourselves in an a priori thought loop that has the likes of at least our governments until recently refusing to engage in questions about the relative harms of drugs and what are proportionate versus disproportionate interventions. It goes something like this. The United Nations told us that all drugs are equally bad and must be prohibited. So we, your local sovereign governments, agree that they're all bad and must be prohibited. Sit down now and behave. Compound this with the fact that despite having one of the most progressive and liberal constitutions in the world, which is studied and celebrated across the globe, we South Africans found ourselves apparently emerging from a decade of so-called state capture, this being where our state-owned enterprises were literally looted by officials from the inside out and straight into the darkness of COVID 2019 lockdown. In an unprecedented before since move, our government banned the sale of tobacco and alcohol products. This was apparently to protect us from ourselves. Imagine how we all felt when we later learned that the inevitable thriving of the black market in these things had been achieved by the friends and associates of so many of the same government officials who had thought up the draconian laws in the first place. How does this sort of abuse reduce inequality? And I refer back to our sustainable development goals. In 2018, we South Africans had a major legal victory in our constitutional court when it came to cannabis law reform. I was there in court on that. In theory, we can all now cultivate, possess and consume cannabis in private. Yet, five years on, we still don't see that the average South African is provided with the equal opportunity to uplift themselves out of poverty in what ought by now to be a reasonably and rationally regulated cannabis and hemp industry. We have some reason to believe that many officials who have been holding back the liberalization of our cannabis laws may have been motivated by the same shadow interests as had tobacco and alcohol unconstitutionally prohibited in 2020. Is this how we promote and protect so many of those overlapping and interrelated SDGs, especially things like an economic boost and greater renewable energy security are so sorely needed in my country? In the meantime, average, Petty drug users continue to be intimidated, harassed, and shaken down for bribes by the South African police services, all because there hasn't yet been a clear executive order for them to cease such human rights abuses. With respect, our executive, self-interest and all, still has room to point its finger at vague and frankly outdated obligations apparently owed to this umbrella body. Lives and livelihoods of countless average people continue to be ruined daily all under the auspices of preventing the harms of drugs that have so long ago proved to be insignificant when compared to the established harms of being dragged through any criminal justice system. All the worse in societies such as mine, which traumatically favor notions of retributive and punitive justice over softer, more human notions such as restorative justice. 
and the reasonable accommodation of difference and diversity. We heard on Monday from the likes of Uruguay, Canada, the Netherlands and Colombia about how treating the drug issue a little more sensitively to human rights hasn't had the sky fall down on their heads. In fact, the opposite, trend lines remain constant. The cautious approach conclusion always seems to remain that these are still early days, not all relevant data is in, and we won't yet know what is what for some time to come. If this is indeed all new data yet to be computed and understood, then is this not a direct concession that the data was never there in the first instance to have justified Mr. Anslinger's internationally adopted approach to the war on drugs? To me, this suggests that instead of drug users having to wait for the United Nations and its member states to, to fully interrogate and then motivate the notion of dropping the war on drugs, and I repeat again, it's actually a war on drug users, the correct and rational approach ought instead to be for them to motivate why they wish to keep fighting any part of this long scale war for even a moment longer. Hasn't there already been enough of making civil society beg for the basic human rights to which they ought anyway to be entitled? If the United Nations and the World Health Organization have realized, as they seem to have, that the original motivations for the war on drugs are slipping or have fallen away, then they ought to state their abandonment with the same sort of clarity and certainty as when they first adopted it at the request of its more dominant member states so many horrible decades ago. Only then will the likes of my own government have their own illegitimate justifications eroded and will the groundwork be laid for the international advancement of human rights and equality in the drug space. Member states need to know that they don't owe it to the UN to lock their drug users in cages. Like it or not, more clear statements from the, from the United Nations are the only thing that will lead the way in this instance. Please, we beg of you, honorable excellencies of the United Nations, let us not fall back on red tape for the sake of red tape. It was all anyway put there by this, umbra by this umbrella body itself. In fairness, yes, we do understand that things like the Vienna Consensus cannot be easily wished away. But the words of His Excellency, the High Commissioner on Human Rights, being essentially that drug prohibition is an abuse of human rights, ought to be front and center of the clear messages that the UN conveys to its member states going forward. Please, again, with due respect, let us cease with further statements of problems without solutions. Self-created bureaucracy surely cannot mean that civil society must wait even longer to claim their rights. Who, within reason, with and to their own bodies and minds, whatever they like, absent government interference and or punishment. Remember, you all exercised those very rights this morning when you drank your espressos and ate your chocolate pastries. Sustainable development goal number 10, reduced inequalities. Thank you all sincerely. Sorry, Ryan Adenoff, MD, is an addiction psychiatrist and academician. He is presently the president of Doctors for Cannabis Regulation and a clinical professor at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. He retired in 2018 as a distinguished professor of alcohol and drug abuse research at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and as a psychiatrist for 30 years with the Veterans Affairs. Dr. Adonoff has published more than 200 articles, reviews, and book chapters on the Recording in progress. treatment of addiction and is the editor of the American Journal of Drug and Alcohol Abuse. In his semi-retired status, he has become increasingly involved in advancing drug policy reform. Thank you for joining us today, Brian. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, sorry, we're having some technical issues. Um, hopefully, well, we'll get you so you can see the slides. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about cannabis law reform and sustainable development goals uh, from a medical perspective. Um, I'm going to address three of the goals, uh, two of the goals. Uh, the first is goal number three, health and well-being. And the second is goal number 16 on justice, human rights, and rule of law. These two are inextricably linked, 
Uh, you really can't have one without the other. It's been, as Paul Michael was mentioning, it's it's been very reassuring and heartening to hear, even in our plenary speakers from the, the chair and the um, uh, executive director of, of the uh, CND, uh, about the injustice of the drug war and, and the large financial and uh, social and individual costs of the drug war. Um, and actually the, the interaction between justice and health is uh, uh, key to the logo of Doctors for Cannabis Regulation um, that was mentioned that I'm president of and is a group, incidentally, of several hundred physicians who support the legalization evidence-based regulation of cannabis. Uh, and we have the, the medical staff of Escalate, Glade uh, PS, and the balance of Lady Justice um, intertwined together. And I, I like to think of this as an international symbol, but thinking about it as I prepare the talk uh, is actually from Greek and Roman mythology. So I'm not sure it's these symbols are actually known to, to many of the audience. Uh, so cannabis as a medicine goes back almost 5,000 5, years. Uh, it was in the U U.S. pharmacopoeia until 1936 when it got pulled after the uh, Marijuana Tax Act of 1937 essentially um, made it illegal. And it, uh, I, I won't go into the medical aspects of cannabis except to say that it's been used uh, and is presently used to treat uh, uh, many, many illnesses. Uh, some of them are more evidence-based than others, but certainly it has demonstrated enormous promise um, and is used now in a lot of places, as I'll talk about. Uh, from a, a sustainable development perspective uh, that Paul Michael was referring to in terms of inequities, it's inexpensive to grow, it grows most everywhere, and it's native to many indigenous societies. Here's a map of where cannabis is presently legal for either medical or adult use. And it's uh, primarily in four continents, uh, North and South America, Europe, and Australia. Um, but even though it's officially legal, primarily for medical in these countries, uh, that doesn't mean that it's accessible. There is not a regulatory infrastructure. Uh, you can't necessarily uh, grow it or uh, distribute it or get access to it. And perhaps the main problem is that doctors don't know anything about it. Of 40,000 uh, clinicians who are able to prescribe it, for instance, in the United Kingdom, only 100 do. So what do we need to do? Um, first, we need to educate physicians and other medical providers on the endocannabinoid system and how it is useful as a medication. Uh, we re we need to do more than just reschedule it. UN rescheduled cannabis uh, two years ago, and while meaningful, it is it's still uh, it's it's still illegal. And in fact, uh, the ICBN uh, last week mentioned that uh, they criticized countries who legalized it, saying it's against UN treaties. So it's necessary to remove cannabis from the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs and the other two treaties. Uh, we need to protect home cultivation, and we need a regulatory framework for both medical and adult use cannabis, including protection of minors, reasonable taxation, protection of small business, and ease of medical research. Uh, Doctor for Cannabis Regulation, DFCR, I think has made a good step uh, towards this regulatory framework. One of our major con contributions, I believe, is the development of an intoxicate, international intoxicating cannabis product symbol, or IICPS. And every state uh, in the U.S. who has legal cannabis has developed their own so-called universal cannabis symbol. Uh, we can't all be universal. Um, the IICPS stands out in that 
is number one, it's been approved and integrated by three states in the US, uh, but more important, it has been approved by ASTM, which is one of the world's large uh, standardization organizations. And along with um, approving the uh, IICPS, and there it is uh, in yellow, a yellow yield sign, uh, and abide by all the international uh, requirements for international symbols. Uh, and then it, the ASTM also includes a label uh, that shows how the constituents should be described. Uh, the second goal, justice and human rights, uh, cannabis prohibition impacts individual, particularly those that are disenfranchised and of lower income uh, and those in cultures um, uh, e even though it's, it's legal, and um, as I mentioned, in uh, four continents, that's only 25% of the population. There's likely still millions of arrests for cannabis annually. I, I could not actually get an actual count um, so that those numbers aren't easily available anyways. In addition to arrest and incarceration, there's loss of employment, uh, loss of government funds for various things, housing, you can lose immigration status, uh, driver's license, school uh, scholarships, you can lose custody. But perhaps most important in uh, the Paul Michael was referring to is the trauma associated with being arrested and incarcerated and all these losses. So this is really where the integration of health and well-being and justice comes in if you are arresting people for really no meaningful uh for, for doing perhaps no more than uh you know think of it as caffeine or sugar as is paul michael was referring to um and and the trauma that is exposed that one is exposed to from merely possession possessing cannabis uh how can you have health and well-being again what needs to happen is the same as I talked about for health and well being because they are tied together. The only thing I would add here is automatic expungement and that um, we, anyone with a prior arrest or conviction for cannabis, it needs to be expunged and not by applying for it, but it just needs to be done automatically. Um, and and th that the automatic expungement is now taking place in a lot of US states. It wasn't initially, but as time goes on, that is becoming more and more the norm of states that are legalizing cannabis. And that needs to be done, of course, worldwide. And I will stop there. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address this group. There we go. Thank you very much, Brian. Our next speaker is uh, not only a, um, a veteran of uh, the United States Air Force, but also a veteran of CND. Michael Krawitz, a disabled United States Air Force veteran, a sergeant from 1981 to 1986 began his work in the United Nations during the 1998 UNGAS, where he presented a table display in the General Assembly Hall on the basic human right of access to medicine. An active member of the Vienna NGO Committee for over a decade, Michael's work was instrumental in the success of the Vienna NGO Committee's Beyond 2008 resolution process. Michael went on to lead the efforts to reinstate the New York NGO Committee in time to support a large NGO presence during the 2016 UNGAS. Michael worked closely with the WHO leading up to and during the critical review of cannabis and through the following C&D process on, the, on those WHO cannabis recommendations. And we all know that the 2020 rescheduling of cannabis was a seminal moment here at the UN and for um, cannabis activists worldwide. Thank you for joining us today, Michael. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. We're depending on where you are in the in the world. Um, I think I, I I don't have a prepared statement today, and uh, 
uh, actually uh, current events are, are quite upsetting. So I'm going to do my best here. But I, I do want to just try to give you a little bit of a feel for where we're at, where we're going uh, with, with policy and, and some of the challenges that we faced. Um, my story, just to start out, um, as uh, Myrtle said, I'm a disabled United States Air Force veteran. I uh, became injured while I was serving in Guam, USA, and uh, uh, basically uh, in a two-second period just redirected my life in a, in a very different direction uh, than, I, than I was going to go in. Um, I was on a, on a sort of a career track, and uh, next thing I know, I'm suffering through surgeries. And I think I had 13 surgeries in total between the Department of Veterans Affairs and the uh, U.S. Air Force to sort of put me back together. And then they sent me home. Um, I, at that time in the 1980s, um, although it was technically, you know, certainly possible to know about cannabis uh, for medicine, I kind of learned about it the hard way. Um, sort of uh trial and error, uh, sort of a genesis, if you will, you know, from the understanding of cannabis that we all had in the 1970s, you know, when I grew up uh, in, in that time period, uh, which is a very, very different understanding of cannabis, very little understanding of its medicinal value, uh, more a, associated with uh, counterculture. Um, I uh, eventually would find myself really depending on, on cannabis as a medicine. Um, I went through, I, I've lost count of how many different medications and treatments that they've had me on at the VA to try to deal with pain, to try to deal with uh, some of the associated, you, you, you wind up with symptomatic relief medications for the relief of symptoms that you have from the other medications. Uh, and, and it's a somewhat of a cascade. And what I found with cannabis was that I was able to use it and effectively reduce the amount of pain medication that I was using. Now I've got a stomach injury as well as a artificial hip. So that combination makes it very difficult for me to tolerate the pills. And by taking a very, very small amount of opiate pain medication together with the cannabis, I find that I can get more relief than I can get with the opiates alone, no matter how much I took. And I certainly would have a terrible side effects from that. And also, interestingly, more effect than I'd ever get from the cannabis alone. So that combative effect, that, that symbiotic relationship that seems to exist between the cannabinoids and the opiates uh, is very important for me. So I first set out to try to figure out, okay, I'm a medical patient. That's my experience. But what are other medical patients experiencing? Is this similar to other, other patients? And what I found out was it's actually a very common claim that, in fact, it's the most common claim. The most common use that we found for cannabis has been for pain. And the most common claim that we get from patients is that they're able to reduce the amount of the narcotic uh, pain medication and other, other medications, uh, antipsychotic medications, antidepressant medications. Many uh, veterans that are using for post-traumatic stress are able to put aside a whole cocktail of medications and, and uh, uh, you know, really be able to get much better relief uh, with a smaller subset of, of, of the pharmaceutical drugs, which again, seem to carry so much more negative side effects. So that's, that's kind of my, my, uh, my personal story. I, I think what I would want to first start out with is some of the damage done by prohibition. Um, it, we, we've had so much of our culture in, a, in, in not just in the United States, but around the world, adjusted by prohibition, and we don't even realize it. So I, let me take you back, I, I take you back first to my own personal story. I grew up in the auction business. I uh, have a lifetime of experience in antiques, uh, and that grounding of history and, and understanding the artifacts, the artifacts tell us the story of cannabis as a medicine. So let me describe. From 1850 to 1950, we had a period of exploration that was essentially taking the old world knowledge from India, from, from Asia, and uh, uh, Dr. O'Shaughnessy brought that to the new world. 
Um, and from that point on, we had medications in the United States and throughout the world that were patent medications, especially from about 1880 to 1920. There was an explosion of, of, of access to these patent medications employing cannabis, employing it much the same way that we do now as a combative effect with other medications and by itself. So what has happened with prohibition is it created uh, three things, essentially. Um, one is uh, smoking of cannabis, believe it or not. I, I find very little historical record of smoking of cannabis. There was uh, ritualistic smoking of a hookah and, and that kind of thing. But the majority of those who would, would be taking cannabis for what we would now call recreational purposes were at it, eating it. They were taking it as a candy, uh, hashish candy. And that actually matches up with what we're seeing today. Canada yesterday presented that more and more uh, we're seeing a switch from away from smoking. They said young people are using more vaporization and older people are, are using more edibles. So I think we're migrating back to where we actually were 100 years ago, um, growing indoors under lights. And, and I think I'll emphasize this as one of the biggest problems. As we move forward, we need to take cannabis out of the basement, out of growing it indoors under lights, where it's an environmental horror show. Um, and unsustainable, completely unsustainable, and bring it out back into the, the places where it was grown over 100 years ago. And that's where we get into rebuilding the, the world that has been dismantled by colonialism. We, we the, the prohibition of cannabis is the last vestige of imperialism. And we need to just erase it from, from, from our world. We're working on cannabis appellations in California that we know and we can prove scientifically that the cannabis benefits that we re receive are dependent upon the terroir, where it's grown, how it's grown, the culture that it's grown in, uh, the light and the soil that it's grown in. These all contribute to the outcome and the benefit from this plant. And the plant can't be expressed as a single molecule so well. The, the pharmaceutical corporations around the world, God bless them, they're trying really hard and, and we support them in their efforts to find single molecule solutions. But we are dealing with a plant. We don't need double blind placebo based studies. We, we didn't mind doing double blind placebo based studies to prove that cannabis is a medicine to get it out of the prohibition lockdown. But we never intended to start a cascade of proving with double blind placebo based studies that it works for every single thing that imagine if you had to do that for every common reliever, a pain reliever or, or a headache reliever, and you had to prove with a double blind placebo based study that it worked for every single thing in the huge list of things that it may be applicable for. That's not unacceptable. So we really need to get cannabis grown back where it was grown over 100 years ago grown by the, the villages and the people around the world under the sun on the equator um, and, and uh, remove the stumbling blocks for industry to be able to allow for these small craft producers of cannabis to engage in the, in the world uh, that we're in. And right now, the way it is unfolding, unfortunately, I think adversely influenced by the opposition to marijuana, who just seems to throw sand in the gears of any efforts that we do to, to create good regulation. Um, we need to be able to uh, allow for those individuals to grow around the world. Right now, we're giving a big edge to big, big corporate interests that have the ability to uh, navigate the geopolitical landscape that's left over from colonialism. So we need to get together uh, I'll just say in closing, we need to get together. We need to work together on prevention, on treatment, on harm reduction, on medicinal access. These are things that, as they say in the other room, we have a common and shared responsibility to move forward and to make sure that we ensure access for everyone. And I, I'll just have to say one more thing, and I'll go over by a minute. I promised my friends from Helmand Valley Growers that I'd mention something about suicide. Um, we have reason to believe that. Um, there are ways that we can reduce the amount of suicide that we're seeing in the United States and around the world. In the United States, the military veterans are taking their own lives at a greater rate than they were dying in the battlefield. And cannabis has been shown to help in the toolkit of dealing with uh, re reducing and eliminating suicide, along with better access to more efficient and more, you go into a VA hospital and unless you're 
imminently going to hurt yourself or others, they won't even admit you. They won't even help you. We need to expand services. We need to have proactive services. And in that is probably the one thing I'll agree with Kevin Sabet. Um, but uh, when they say that the, the, the cannabis is uh, more dangerous because it has higher THC, I'll refer you to the FDA who approved THC as a medicine and allow it to be distributed to patients in pure form, 100% THC. I don't understand when they say that cannabis in the plant is somehow higher THC than pure THC. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, our next uh, speaker is Marin Krings, who is a German photographer and climate impact storyteller. I did say that we have uh, uh, three very diverse, or very diverse speakers today. Oh. Marin's work seeks solutions to socio-ecological impacts to help mitigate the current climate crisis. Krings has a BFA from the Savannah College of Art and Design in the USA, and her work has been published in leading international publications and shown at museums and universities in, uh, internationally. Marin is the author of four books. Her latest publication, which is really, really a seminal work on hemp, it is called H is for hemp. It reflects on her six year journey into the worldwide rediscovery. As Michael was saying, we need to be cognizant of the history. And Marin works on the rediscovery of industrial hemp in 26 countries and four continents. Krings photographed more than 200 projects and interviewed more than 80 industry experts to show the plant's potential to mitigate the socio-ecological crisis. The encyclopedia-style book is printed on tree-free hemp paper, and we know that that was no mean feat, exclusively produced by German paper manufacturer Hauenmuller. Marin, welcome to CND. We know that you only just arrived this morning. And thank you so much for joining us on our panel. Thank you very much for having me here. And uh, good morning and a big hello out to the world to whatever time zones we're on. Um, Yes, while while we're working on the screen share here, I uh, I will say on a little personal note that I couldn't have any better nurturing ground to uh, talk about my mission of the last six years with all my previous speakers who have really addressed in uh, such a detailed and clear manner what this is about today and why we're here and and why we need to deschedule cannabis and um, here we go. This was. Uh, a landing on the dot. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> I just do this. Yeah. You can use that. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yes. So, of course, Myrtle has already introduced it. This is the book that that basically was my entry to this whole story. And interestingly enough, I mean, today most of our talk will be on on drugs, on the cannabis, on the psychoactive parts, on the descheduling my way into the whole world of cannabis was actually really hemp and um, I got to know this plan basically in the beginning through food and a completely carbon neutral actually even a carbon negative building material so when I set out to do my travels it was actually much later that I came across or much later but it was a good while into the project that suddenly I heard that term of medical cannabis medical marijuana and this is where it kind of you know dawned on me that there is this one single cannabinoid that actually separates nature from something that's a drug apparently and something that's you know paper that is clothing that is house building that is something that actually completely uh, refers to our sustainable development goals because it helps us actually cover all of our human basic needs so it was always very astonishing to me, and obviously I'm not going to go into all of the depth and uh, chapters of the book. I do want to keep it short because I want to leave time for the questions. 
But let me reiterate on the paper topic. Um, paper was quite a logic topic for me to really get into. As a photographer, I knew I was going to produce this book. The book is pretty thick. It's got 624 pages. I knew that I was going to carry on my responsibility quite a bit of deforestation more as to what we have. If we're going back in history, we know that up until eight, about 1850, um, paper was still made from rag, which means clo old clothes being collected. Most of them were, just as this jacket that I'm wearing, from hemp and from linen, or from flax, which amounts to linen. This stuff was ground up into paper pulp, and then the paper was produced. So our paper was very much a hemp and flax paper. If you look, and I'm not sure if you can decipher that on the on the screen, but if you look at the chart on the on the left hand side, you will see very much on the bottom this teeny tiny scrap of three percent, and that's all that's left of non wood origin for pulp nowadays. And this is huge potential we're giving away. We already know that hemp as a plant, and when I say hemp, I do want to expand this here in the circle to cannabis. Of course, when I promote the book or when I talk about the topic. I stay with hemp because otherwise I cause so much confusion. I'm even ca caught up as an author in this topic of what's what, constantly having to frame. But we do know that this plant delivers so much fiber that we can use for the auto automotive industry, for paper, for clothing, for technical fiber, for building and insulation. There is so much to do with this that I don't think we have the time to really waste on, you know, Keeping a, a plant, a plant from Mother Nature trapped in this category of drugs that actually lets us continue to deplete, deplete these natural uh, boreal old growth forests, which are supposed to be a biodiversity hub. They're here to create our air. They're here to, to keep our biodiversities. They're here to keep the carbon stored in the ground. And we all know forests are a huge bearer of carbon as a carbon sink but we use them for the paper and we could easily fix that. Now, one of the points that I really want to make is that having cannabis still considered as a drug and not being able to fully deschedule this plant is going to effectively keep us from using all of these benefits that we could use for climate change mitigation, which in this image you see that hemp is even grown on contaminated grounds. It has the potential of pulling up most of the uh, heavy metals from the ground, from the soil, even up to nuclear contamination. And this is being researched, uh, especially in South Africa. There's a very, very um, promising project. And we cannot afford to have these processes, you know, delayed just because the talk is still, what are we talking about? Is this hemp? Is this cannabis? Is this drug? Is this psychoactive? It's one and the same plant. We need to free it to really use its full potential. And that's probably the one potential that's going to keep us on this earth. I think nobody else is really concerned. I want to say thank you. Um, of course, there's more to tell and, and more to see. If whoever is interested, if you scan the barcode, you can uh, follow me on the website and also on social media with the book progress and, and also the ongoing project. And I just want to say thank you for everybody's attention. And thank you very much, Marin. Um, we've just had notice that we need to uh, vac vacate our room. So unfortunately, we don't have time for, for more questions today. But uh, you please are very welcome to contact us. Our name is uh, quite easy to remember, Fields of Green for All. And uh, you can contact us on our website or on numerous social media platforms if you have any pressing questions. We will should be sure to get back to you on those uh, various platforms. And be on behalf of the Fields of Green for All international team and our supporting organizations, both here in Vienna and back home in uh, the United States and in South Africa. We thank you very much for joining us today because we know coming from developed and developing countries that cannabis is a gateway drug. It is the gateway to more sustainable development, to the attainment of our sustainable development goals. And if 
we can push aside the red tape and if we can move on like we have in the last three years in the CND and make some progress, then I think we might have a chance of attaining fields of green for all. Thank you very much.